Uh, good evening and thank you for joining us for this live stream presentation, The Night Sky in March with Galen Gisler. I am Laura Marcelia with Pajarito Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Uh, I will be the moderator for today's talk. We are able to offer programming at this time because of our wonderful members and donors, so we'd like to thank you for your continuing support. Uh, now to introduce Galen, uh, he was born in Clovis, New Mexico and graduated high school there. Uh, with a PhD in astrophysics from the University of Cambridge, he eventually came to Los Alamos where he worked at the lab for 25 years. Then he and his wife Susan moved to Norway where he learned not quite enough geology at the University of Oslo, finally retiring back to their cozy mountain town. The Peak Planetarium is his favorite place to spend time. All right, and with that, Galen, take it away. Thanks, Laura. Um, yes, I'm Galen Gissler, and I'll be talking about what we can expect to see in, um, in the skies in March. Um, I'm gonna turn off my video so that's not distracting. Um, we're, yeah, let's see, there we go. <clears throat> So um, this is a picture that um, that was on the astronomy picture of the day just uh, um, yesterday, in fact, um, and it shows Mars, of course, right next to the Pleiades, and then over here the Hyades with its bright star Aldebaran. Um, there is a um, a nebula called the California Nebula because it it um, it sort of has that shape. It would be it will be interesting to watch. Mars um, during the course of this month because right now it's it's very close to the Pleiades. In fact, it's it was closest to the Pleiades just a, just a couple of days ago on March the third. It's still pretty close, but um, but during the course of the of the month, it's going to be moving along the ecliptic more or less in this direction, and um, and passing very close to Aldebaran um, in the Hyades. Um, and I'll I'll demonstrate that in, in the planetarium program that I'm that I'm using. But first, um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, a little bit about what is happening in the morning sky um, these days. Um, I got up this morning at 5:30 and saw Jupiter and Mercury very, very close to each other. Um, if you get up tomorrow morning, they will still be close to each other, but not quite as close as they were this morning. Still, you should be able to see them. And if you haven't had a chance to see Mercury before, um, many people haven't seen Mercury these days. Um, this is a good chance because it's very close to Jupiter and you'll be able to identify it on uh, uh, close to the east-southeast horizon, um, close to Jupiter. And of course, you'll also see Saturn a little bit farther away. So I'm missing the planetarium as, um, as I suspect several of you are as well. But um, I've become quite familiar with a planetarium software program called Carte de Ciel or SkyChart. Um, it's free, open source. It works on all the platforms you can think of. Um, it's easy to make printouts from it. It's easy to make jet, uh, your observing list from it. It's uh, frequently updated. In fact, almost too frequently. Um, and it has access to all the all the proper catalogs. Um, so I. I recommend this to anybody who's interested in, in, in um, exploring this stuff a little bit further. And I'll be using that for the majority of this talk. What I'm gonna do, so you see in my sidebar over here, my navigation bar for Keynote are pictures of various objects that um, were taken with uh, um, professional or professional instruments or with Hubble or, or um, advanced amateur in instruments. Um, and I'll be showing you where to find these objects in the sky using the Carte de Ciel program. So let's go over to Carte de Ciel. Um, here's the, um, the sky as it is, or as it will be tonight at, um, at 8.30. Um, you can see the coordinates up here. <clears throat> What uh, we see, of course, is the Milky Way, the winter Milky Way stretching across the sky from um, Canis Major, the big dog, uh, passing north of Orion, between Orion and, and Gemini, through Auriga, through Perseus and Cassiopeia, um, going all the way to the north. We see the familiar constellations that we've been living with all winter long. Um, Orion, of course, Taurus, the bull. There's the Pleiades with Mars right next to it. 
Auriga, the charioteer, and Gemini, um, the twins. And of course, Canis Major with its very bright star Sirius, Canis Minor with its bright star Procyon, and so forth. So here's Mars next to the Pleiades. And what I'm going to do is, um, is show how Mars advances day by day. Let's see, Mars is moving away from the Pleiades more towards the direction of the Hyades. And watch what happens shortly. Here comes the moon. And on the 19th, the moon and Mars will both be very close together um, at um, near the Hyades. If we let this go a little bit further, then we see the moon passing by Castor and Pollux in the constellation Gemini. Let's bring this back to tonight. Run this backwards. Moon's passed close to Mars <clears throat> and now Mars is going back in time, approaching the Pleiades again. And there we are tonight. So here we are, the, the, our familiar constellations of the wintertime, which are in the west now. And so we'll be losing them over the course of the next few months. Um, we also lose them over the course of a single night. Um, so what I'm going to do now is advance the time by hours over the course of the night, um, demonstrating how how they uh, um, how how this, these uh, constellations and the, and the winter milk winter Milky Way set in the west as the night goes on. Well, so we'll just one step at a time. Um, get our Orion setting. This is about half past midnight. And look what happens at about 1.30 in the morning. We've almost entirely lost the Milky Way that's been with us all winter long. And we start to see the Milky Way on the other side. Um, over here is Scorpio. Sagittarius hasn't risen yet. But what this tells us is that we are, so the disk of our galaxy is of course represented by the Milky Way. So in this view, we are looking directly out of the plane of our galaxy, straight out into intergalactic space. Um, <clears throat> this is an interesting phenomenon, it happens twice a year um, when the Milky Way rests on the horizon and, um, and we're either looking out towards the northern galactic pole or the opposite time of year towards the southern galactic pole. I was a postdoc um, 45 years ago at, um, at Kitt Peak National Observatory. And I observed that starting in March, we had a whole different crew of visitors coming to use the telescopes. Of course, in those days, you couldn't remote into your telescopes. You had to be there to, uh, to use them. And so the, the people who were coming in um, during March and, and they um, came through um, in April and May and, and so forth during the dark times of the moon are the extragalactic observers because these are the times of year when you can <laughs> access <clears throat> most readily the, um, the northern galactic pole. And, um, and there's a whole host of galaxies up in that region of the sky, which, uh, which I'll be talking about um, during the course of, of, um, of this talk. <clears throat> so, um, so we have the winter Milky Way just setting over here in the west, the summer Milky Way starting to rise here in the, in the east at about 1.30 in the morning <clears throat> as, um, as the weeks and months go by. Um, the winter Milky Way will be setting earlier and the summer Milky Way will be rising earlier <clears throat> until finally in, um, in July and August, the, the summer Milky Way with its, with its great star clouds and Sagittarius will be dominating our, our point of view. But for now, <clears throat> we're looking out into the void, out into intergalactic space. And, um, and that's, kind of, that's what's kind of exciting about this time of year. So let's go back to um, our earlier evening, 
in the evening. So what I'm going to do is rotate this, this uh, planisphere around so that we have the western horizon here down at the bottom. So um, to orient you again here, we have Orion and Taurus, um, the Pleiades and Mars over here, Perseus and Andromeda, and so forth. So um, I want to zoom in on this object right here, this object between Cassiopeia and Andromeda, which is, of course, um, Messier number 31, the uh, Andromeda galaxy. And we can zoom in on it. We see it there with its two companions, M32 and NGC 205. And if we go back to Keynote, we can um, look at a picture that was taken by this, um, this uh, professional astronomer, David Dag, um, and, um, and it's stored on, on Wikipedia. The Andromeda Galaxy is just a fantastic um, sight, even in a small telescope. I mean, it's, it's inspiring to, to realize that the light that is coming to you from this object has been traveling through space for two and a half million years before it comes to rest on, on your retina. Um, that's, uh, um, for me, that's a symbol of, of the fact that we are all deeply connected to, um, to the entirety of, of our universe. Um, so let's go back to our horizon and and then, the, uh, so we'll just just look at two objects in, in this part of the sky, the part of the sky that's south of the winter Milky Way. And the other one, of course, is the famous Orion Nebula. Um, and we'll look at it there. Um, you, know where, you know how to find it. It's um, in the sword of Orion hanging down below his belt. And of course, going back to the keynote, <clears throat> this is a picture from Hubble, which shows these magnificent colors, the red due to ionized um, hydrogen gas, the green due to, due to some oxygen and some helium, um, and all the other colors being a mix of the various elements that, that, um, that are radiating um, in this nebula. Of course, the Orion Nebula is um, is a birthplace of stars. Um, we've talked about this um, several times over the last, well, <laughs> ever since we've started doing these talks at the planetarium. But here's the trapezium, these four stars right in the core of the um, Orion Nebula, which uh, Galileo discovered with his little three inch telescope. You can see those four, four stars of the trapezium nebula if you've got good binoculars or a small telescope. You might, you, um, you might also see some of the fuzz that surrounds this, but, um, um, but, but that trapezium, the, those four very hot and very bright stars, which are often washed out in long exposures, like, um, like the one that we see here. You can't even see, see those stars, um, but, but you can see them with your eye um, through a small telescope or, or through binoculars. Um, that's, uh, that's kind of a wonderful experience, connecting you with, uh, with Galileo um, and all of his other marvelous discoveries. So we're going to um, leave the western sky now. I mean, there's lots of other objects over there, but of course we've had the chance to study them over the course of, the, of this past winter. Um, and, um, and so now we have to take leave of what's probably everybody's favorite constellation, Orion, um, and the Pleiades, and all of these things as we turn our attention to the stars of the spring sky. And so here we have Leo, um, the lion, um, probably the most prominent co constellation of, of, the, of the spring sky. Um, Cancer here in between Leo and Gemini, um, not very many bright stars at all. Hydra, this snake that, uh, that circles around here. And we have a portion of Virgo. We can't see all of Virgo, but it's here. And then also, of course, we don't typically think of, um, of the Big Dipper or Ursa Major as a spring constellation because it's circumpolar. It's with us all year long um, and circulates around the pole star here, Polaris. But um, in the springtime, it's actually easier to see the Big Dipper um, because it's more prominent in the 
in the eastern sky. And um, as the summer, as the spring rotates on, the Big Dipper will move further in this direction, closer to, oops, closer to um, the meridian, and, and it will be still easier to see. Um, so let's look directly at the eastern horizon. Uh, yeah, there we are, eastern horizon. So here's Leo again. Um, Cancer, the um, Ursa Major, the Big Dipper, and over here, just now rising, is uh, is the constellation Bootis. So what I'm going to do now, um, before I go to the galaxies, which are the main feature of of the of this part of the sky, um, I'll talk about two open clusters. We've talked a lot about open clusters. I had, a, um, I, I featured these two clusters in a talk that I gave, I don't know, a couple of months ago. Um, they're here in the constellation of Cancer. And this one right here is, is called Prisipi or the manger, because the Greeks and the Romans said that it was um, the eating place, the manger where the these two donkeys ate. These two stars are donkeys and they ate at this manger. This one is called the Northern Ass. The name of the star in, in Latin means Northern Ass. This one is called the Southern Ass. So um, this um, cluster is called, um, whoops, why don't, I'm puzzled about something here. There we go. This cluster is called um, Messier 44, um, or the Praesepi, um, Latin for manger, or it's also sometimes called the beehive cluster. I don't actually actually see a beehive there, um, and that's one of the donkeys that's uh, that's eating at this manger. Um, here is a picture from Sturthegi. Um, of the beehive cluster or the praesepi. Um, actually, it has this triangular feature that looks, looks a lot like the Hyades, but you can tell it's not the Hyades because we don't see that bright star Aldebaran um, in this picture. And let's go back out. And then we'll look at this other cluster right here, um, M67. which is a nice tight cluster. Um, it's almost reminiscent of globular clusters, um, but it is in fact an open cluster. It has, it has some of the features of a globular cluster in that it is located high above the galactic plane and there is a distinct concentration of stars towards, towards the middle um, as opposed to most open clusters, which are more diffuse. This cluster is one of the very oldest um, open clusters that we have in our galaxy, um, but it's still far younger than, um, than the globular clusters. M67 has um, an estimated age of, um, of about three to four billion years old. Um, so that's, that's an old cluster. Um, it's younger yet than our sun, which is still about uh, four and a half to five billion years old. Um, but um, M67 and another cluster, um, NGC 188, had been um, very important signposts for us in deciphering the, uh, um, the uh, story of how stars live out their lives. Um, I talked about this in my talk on star clusters a um, month and a half or, or so ago. And I'll bring back to Keynote and show um, this picture from the uh, digital sky, the second iteration of the digital sky survey of, um, of M67. So now let's turn our attention to galaxies. And um, let's first look at the Big Dipper, Ursa Major. There are a bunch of galaxies associated with this with this um, asterism, this constellation. And um, 
and some and some of them are actually cataloged as being in Ursa Major, and some of them are cataloged as being in this small constellation, Canis Fanatici, um, the hunting dogs. <clears throat> I'm going to um, focus on these two up here at the moment, which are Messier numbers 81 and 82. Um, there is a third galaxy in this um, triplet. <clears throat> um, Messier 81 is a, um, a grand, what, what people call a grand design spiral galaxy and that has um, you know, well delineated spiral arms that go um, well outside the, the core of the galaxy. Um, and um, and it, it's, you know, it seems to have a lot of regularity to it. Um, these other two are irregular galaxies, M82, and um, the name of this is NGC 3077. Um, these are, are more distorted galaxies, and, and, um, and the reason for that is because they have been tugged apart partially by the gravitational influence of, um, of this giant galaxy M81. Um, these, uh, these three galaxies are all about um, 12 million light years away from us, and I'll show a picture from Keynote um, of M81 and M82, um, in which you can you can more easily trace the spiral arms, which go all the way down into the into the core of the galaxy, and then look at uh, M82's rather rather tortured um, appearance. Um, and this red stuff isn't blood, <laughs> though it may may look like that. It's a uh, um, a violent star forming region and lots of um, of hi ionized hydrogen gas there um, showing up in the in in the center of it. So that's uh, um, that's the M eighty one group at uh, at about twelve million light years away from us um, in the constellation of Ursa Major. Um, so this talk is sandwiched between two talks. Um, Didier Salmon, you may have heard his talk last week where he talked about Charles Messier and his catalog um, from which most of the objects that I'm gonna be showing you come. Um, and then next week, Dan Reisenfeld mm -hmm. will be giving a talk specifically about galaxies. So um, any questions that, uh, that I um, don't answer, um, which are probably many, you will be able to ask him. So now um, there's a galaxy right here that is just below the end star of the tail of the bear or the handle of the dipper, um, but it's, it doesn't actually belong to the constellation of Ursa, Ma Ursa Major. It, it belongs instead to the constellation of Canis Venatici. Um, and that galaxy is M51, which you will probably recognize as the Whirlpool Galaxy um, for, come on, zoom in, there it is, for its shape. Um, <clears throat> this was the first galaxy that was recognized to have spiral structure. Um, and, uh, and you may have heard about this in, in uh, DDA's talk, talk last week. It was, it was uh, um, the Earl of Ross with his gigantic telescope in, in Ireland, 72-inch um, uh, telescope that, uh, that was propped up on, on um, the scaffolding. Um, and he was able to trace out these uh, spiral arms. And, and DDA sh last week showed a sketch of the, of the arms that, 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 that he provided. Um, so it was the first one that was actually called a spiral nebula. Um, and of course, they called all of these things spiral nebulae until they realized that they were external galaxies. Um, and that realization came um, from the work of um, Edwin Hubble principally in, um, in the early part of the uh, 20th century. So jumping back to Keynote, um, here's a magnificent picture of that galaxy, Messier 51, the Whirlpool Galaxy from the Hubble Space Telescope. And here again, you can see the spiral arms tracing um, right down into the core. They're delineated by these, um, these dark streaks, which are clouds of molecular gas and dust, which absorb light, and also by these red splotches, which are uh, the H2 regions, 
regions of, <clears throat> of ionized hydrogen gas, um, and we're, which are um, illuminated by or ionized by the, the newborn stars that are forming out of these molecular clouds in the dark region. So you have these dark regions which, which form new stars and they illuminate these um, H2 regions and th those glow off in, in, uh, in, in this red light of ionized hydrogen. Um, so, um, and it's, it's amazing how far out um, this process of star formation goes. The, um, this blob over here um, is, was originally a separate galaxy and, um, and they are now in the process of, of colliding with one another. Um, and the, the collision is what helps this star formation process in the, in the outermost arms of, um, of M51 um, continue. Go back. Um, so that was M51. We're going to look here um, at M63, another galaxy in Canis Venatici. It's been described as a as a blob of cotton with uh, with all of this stuff kind of coming off um, the uh, the term that um, the observational astronomers um, used in describing it is flocculent um, as if um, you know how you describe wool coming off a, um, a sheep and it, and it you know kind of looks like that those little clumps um, it's again also a spiral galaxy and um, and its distance is uh, is is further. It's about thirty million light years away, and that's this one. Um, those flocules that um, that were apparent in that picture from Cartesiel um, resolve themselves a little bit more, and you can see um, individual stars and lots and lots of patches of of um, of these dark molecular clouds and dust which thread their way all along. The um, the spiral structure is apparent but it's not nearly as well organized as it is in M51. Galaxies come in all different shapes and, and, and forms and Dan Reisenfeld will, um, I'm sure, tell you more about that next week. So after M63, let's look at this other one in Candace of Anatasy, which is M94. It's a very interesting galaxy as well. Um, it doesn't look like much from from this picture, uh, um, it's kind of kind of appears a little diffuse. You can maybe decide for yourself whether those are spiral arms um, and uh, and little blotches of of um, absorbing material and so forth. But let's look at it from a professional astronomer's um, view. <clears throat> this is just amazing. Um, the, the spiral arms are apparent here in, in the middle and they seem to go, you can, you can follow them right down into the very nucleus of the galaxy. But not only that, you see spiral arms going well outside um, the, the core, which is the only thing visible on that, uh, on the, on, on that other picture from Cartesiel. Um, so, um, so this is a really intriguing galaxy. How exactly did, uh, um, did, did, the outer arms become, I don't know, disconnected in a way from the inner arms, um, yet, uh, um, yet they have the same sense, the same you know, counterclockwise or clockwise sense. Um, so, um, so it's not as if, you, um, as if this was a, um, a violent interaction of you know, uh, two different objects, but, um, but rather it's, it is the same thing, but there is this, this gap, this uh, this disconnect somehow between between the inner part and the outer part, um, but maybe a lot of that is absorbing material. Um, I really don't know. Um, it's a it, it seems to me a very intriguing galaxy and one worth um, a consider considerable study. M um, ninety four is um, sixteen million light years away, so not as far as M sixty three, but a little bit farther than uh, than M fifty one.
now let's look for a galaxy, um, let's see, here in, in the um, constellation of Coma, Coma Veronese's, which is, so the, the Coma Veronese's, um, it's, you know, it's not very, not very many bright stars in it, like Canis Venatici, but, but there is this cluster of stars here that was, that was noticed by the ancients. Um, and um, I'm not going to focus in on that because it's, uh, um, it's kind of diffuse and, and, and a little bit hard to, to appreciate, even, at, if, even on a zoomed in view. But what I want to say about it is that, that this constellation was named the Hair of Bernice, Coma Berenices, because um, this um, little cluster of stars looked like um, the locks of, um, of the hair of, uh, of Bernice, whoever that was. But what I want to look at is this galaxy right here, which uh, is a very interesting one, M64. Doesn't look all that interesting from, um, from the image that Carte de Ciel has. Maybe you can see a little bit of the feature that I'm going to show you from, um, from Keynote. Maybe I'll zoom in a little bit more. I don't know if, if it makes any difference. Not really. Um, you see um, that maybe there's a deficit here of the, of the brightness that was uh, apparent in the rest of it is, what kind of galaxy is this? Is this a lenticular or is it a spiral? Um, you can't really tell from this picture. Um, so let's go to the keynote image. And there it is, clearly a spiral. Um, but um, but what what an exotic object! Um, it's called the Black Eye Galaxy because it kind of looks like um, you know um, a shiner um, sported by somebody whose eye is still intact there, but she's got all black and blue marks down here beneath it. Um, I don't know what's going on here. Um, I mean, there is. You can see spiral arms or traces of spiral arms um, in this part. Um, there's a, a tremendous disruption here. Maybe it's due to a companion, which we don't see in this picture. Um, it's a um, partly edge on, but not completely edge on. So you wouldn't expect the um, the absorption that's in that's typical in disks of spiral galaxies to be so obvious from um, from this view, which is not an edge on view. Um, but still, you can see a lot of star formation going on um, in this region. Um, these, these dark areas are, again, molecular clouds. And, um, and these red splotches within that are the, uh, um, are the H2 regions that are ionized by newborn stars um, being born from those molecular clouds. So that's M M64, the Black Eye Galaxy. Okay, so let's look at Leo. Leo has a bunch of galaxies associated with it as well. Um, there, there are these three right here, but I'm gonna focus in on what looks like two here, but it's actually three. Um, and the, these galaxies are, um, are collectively called the, uh, the Leo triplet. Um, come on, yeah, there we go. Um, two of them have Messier numbers. Um, I think, let's see, I'm going to get that wrong. I think, well, I'll show you on the, on the keynote picture. Um, so there are two spirals, maybe three spirals, um, this one being viewed edge on, um, but, um, but this one is clearly distorted. There's, there is interaction going on among these three galaxies. Um, these are fairly far away, 35 million light years away. Um, and um, in a, um, I mean, all of, you know, all of these Messier objects, you know, they were discovered by Messier and his collaborators, Piet, Piet Michan and, and so forth, with small telescopes, typically, um, three to four inch telescopes. Um, often, you can see these in binoculars. Um, and, you know, if you, Take your binoculars and and zoom around Leo. You will run into um, these galaxies and 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 the ones on the other side of Leo. Um, and 
you you won't see much. You'll see you know little fuzz spots. But if you if you have access to a telescope um, and not a very big aperture one and use it at fairly low power, um, the view of all three of these in the same field is um, is really inspiring. You know to be able to see the three galaxies at once. Um, here's the picture from Hunter Wilson. Um, so yeah, M65, M66 are the two Messier objects here. And the one, um, the, the other guy is, um, is from the NGC catalog, NGC 3628. The NGC catalog was compiled in the late 1800s um, and um, comprises several thousand, I think seven or 8,000 galaxies. And then it was later supplemented by what's called the index catalog. Um, and so together, those two catalogs um, have 10 or 11,000 objects. They're, um, they're, uh, many of them are um, much fainter than typical Messier objects because Messier didn't discover them with his small telescope, but a lot of NGC objects are as bright as Messier objects, and, and it's kind of surprising that, uh, that Messier didn't include them um, in his catalog. Um, so, so, that's, uh, so we have the Messier catalog, we have the NGC catalog. Um, nowadays, we have dozens of other catalogs of, of galaxies, as well as catalogs of stars and, and things, and, and uh, um, the lots and lots of places where we can look for data um, on, on these objects. Um, and it's become quite a chore to um, keep track of everything and to assemble it all together. There is a, a project at, the, uh, um, at Harvard and Smithsonian to um, call the Astrophysical Data System, which, um, which has links to all of the catalogs that, that, are, that um, they've been able to compile together. And, um, and that's where people go nowadays to find um, most of the data that they want to, to uh, explore. So that's uh, the Leo triplet. And we'll go back out again. That's what we were looking at right here. There are these other um, galaxies in Leo. I'm not sure why M64 is still highlighted. We can look at, maybe we'll look at these just for fun. So these are um, our three ellipticals, I think. I don't know, it's not telling me what they are. Where they are. But uh, yeah, so th so there's a there's a large number of galaxies in, in Leo, and this is a small a smallish cluster of galaxies. Um, a really interesting barred spiral there, um, a uh, um, what may be a lenticular, and here an elliptical galaxy. So then then we have this lineup right here. And this is the Virgo cluster of galaxies. This is the, the largest accumulation of galaxies in our neighborhood. Um, in fact, the Virgo cluster is part of what we call the Virgo supercluster, which um, includes our own galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy and all the galaxies of our local group, M33, and you know, as well as M31, um, our galaxy, the Magellanic Clouds, of course, all of the companions and, and various others. Um, and, um, and in fact, the, the Leo group <clears throat> um, is also part of the Virgo supercluster. This is also what has been, or this is also the location of what has been termed the great attractor. Um, because if you look at the directions of um, radial velocities um, of all of the galaxies in in um, in our in our local um, part of the universe, they all seem to, seem to be converging towards towards um, Virgo. It's a you know it's 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 not it's um, apart from the general cosmological flow um, where everything is moving um, more or less uniformly away from each other. On top of that, there's a, there are um, uh, proper motions, proper flows, which uh, um, uh, consist of individual pockets of, of gravitational attraction, which pull other galaxies and clusters of galaxies together, but not uh, not completely separating them from the from the general cosmological flow, the Hubble flow, as we call it. So this is the Virgo cluster of galaxies. 
and one galaxy in particular is um, is is very famous, um, and that's Messier number eighty seven. There are a number of Messier galaxies in the in the Virgo cluster, but we're gonna we're gonna look first at M eighty seven. And M eighty seven, um, of course, is that um, galaxy that uh, houses that that. Uh, um, two billion ma solar mass um, black hole in its center, which uh, the Event Horizon Telescope had recently taken a, um, a picture of the shadow of that black hole. Um, there are a couple of companion galaxies um, right next to M87, which are much smaller. M87 is the dominant galaxy in the Virgo cluster. But um, yeah, that zooms in. I wanted to zoom out, um, but there are, lots and lots more galaxies in the Virgo cluster. Virtually everything you see here um, is a galaxy. Um, and some of them are Messier objects, that's M86, um, that's M84. Um, is this one? I forget, no, that's an NGC number, but uh, um, yeah, M88 um, and so on. So there's there's lots of Messier objects. So, so Messier was, was was uh, um, clearly cognizant of the fact that there were lots of these nebulae in this area. Of course, he didn't know they were galaxies. Um, he called them um, nebulae, clouds, um, and, um, and uh, recognized that there was um, a, uh, an agglomeration, a, 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 a cluster of, of these nebulae in, in the Virgo. There's M90, another messy object. Um, and, and all of these little circles are, are ones that, that the Carte du Ciel software doesn't, um, hasn't downloaded images for, but, they're, but these are all galaxies. And if we look at that um, in, in the keynote, this, this object, this picture, um, again, is one that I took from the Wikimedia Commons. Um, here is M87, then M86, M84. Um, and lots and lots of other galaxies in here. Um, some, some of them are very small, very faint. Um, some of them may even be background galaxies. These um, <laughs> cookie cutter um, holes are um, where this guy who um, manipulated this photograph um, excised um, the uh, foreground stars that were um, taking, um, that, you know, with diffraction spikes and all that stuff because he just wanted to look at the galaxies. But the um, uh, Virgo cluster is, is a truly magnificent object um, and, you know, very rich of, of all kinds of galaxies, mostly ellipticals, but you'll see some spirals here and there and, and certainly some irregular galaxies which are being tugged at by um, the mutual gravitational attractions of, of the others. This one, for example, is suffering between M86 and M84. So let's go back to Carte de Ciel and zoom out again. Let's, let's go back to our all sky view and orient this so that south is at the bottom. Um, now what I wanna do is, um, is go again towards the morning and, and we'll look at Let's see, we'll try to stop just as Jupiter, let's see, no, a little bit farther. That's 3.30, 5.30, okay. Yeah, so here we are. Um, here's Saturn, here's Jupiter, and there is Mercury. And I'm gonna draw the ecliptic line here, which uh, um, is the path that all the planets follow, including the moon sitting here. And let's go back to the eastern horizon um, and zoom in a bit. Maybe oh, go back to the horizon. Yeah, and I'm going to move that so that the planets are more or less centered. OK, so this is what it will look like if you get up at 5 30 tomorrow morning and i encourage you to do this it's a uh, you know get out of bed and 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 look at these planets um 
you uh, you won't have another chance to see Saturn and Jupiter, of course, until um, until late in the summer, and you rarely have a chance to see Mercury at all. So um, so here's your chance to see them. But what I want to do now is to show you what's going to happen over um, the next several days. Jupiter gets higher in the sky, Mercury gets lower in the sky. So, um, so it gets harder and harder to see Mercury. Um, so don't wait too long if you want a chance to see Mercury. And, um, and Jupiter and Saturn are, um, you know, they're, they're still moving apart from each other past their, the conjunction that they had last, uh, <clears throat> last December. Um, but, um, but you don't see them, their relative motion nearly as much as you see the relative motion between Jupiter and Mercury. And so now we're um, at the end of March, and I'll stop there. Um, Mercury is, uh, um, is very soon going to be lost in the glare of the sun if it isn't already um, at the end of March. Um, let me advance the time by an hour. And yeah, you see there, the sun is right there. And I believe this must be Venus on the other side of the sun, if I can. Yeah, it's Venus, there's, and there is Mercury and Jupiter and Saturn. And if you are up this early in the morning at, um, um, at the end of March, you'll begin to see the Andromeda Nebula again. The Andromeda Nebula, um, you know, we're, we're losing it from our evening skies, but, um, but it appears again in our morning skies. Um, so um, if you're a, a passionate admirer of the Andromeda galaxy, um, you can start um, watching for it early in the morning towards the end of this month. And with that, I'm going to um, bring us back to, the, to a full sky view. And um, I should probably set the time back to tonight. Um, tonight, um, oh, we're April. Five at twenty thirty apply and bring us back to the south. Come on. Oh, I have to get rid of this first. And with that, I will stop and um, and um, invite questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Galen. Um, we had a message from, let me bring up chat here. Um, from someone saying, these spiral galaxies are incredibly beautiful. And I have to agree. Um, <laughs> I agree too. presentation was gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, question here is the concentration of galaxies in virgo an accidental circumstance or is there something going on in virgo that brings about this concentration ah <laughs> um well that depends on on your point of view right um so the i mean it, it, clusters of galaxies form because of dark matter, basically, the um, intersection of filaments in the early universe, um, the initial fluctuations in, in the early universe, um, uh, cause nucleation to occur and dark matter falls in and then galaxies form. So it's a, um, I mean, from our point of view, it's a happenstance that it, ha that it occurs in the constellation Virgo. Um, I mean, there are other clusters that are more distant. There's, there's um, in fact, a, a, a beautiful cluster here in Coma um, that is considerably more distant than, than the one in Virgo. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't really show up on, on this plot. And there are there's a cluster of galaxies over here in Perseus and a cluster of galaxies in Hercules. There are clusters of galaxies all over the sky. The one in Virgo is the one that's nearest to us of, of the big clusters of galaxies. Um, and um, and it's uh, and the, so 
there is a concept of, of the supergalactic equator, um, which um, runs almost perpendicular to the galactic equator of the equator of our galaxy, um, and um, and that 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 um, runs through the Virgo cluster, um, and that may be you know one of these primordial filaments that um, that we see in in simulations of the early universe, um, and and can trace out. Um, in uh, in detailed plots of of, um, of where galaxies are, are distributed across the sky, but um, I don't think that answers the question um, really. I mean, we don't we don't know why it should be ha happening right in that place in in our sky, but it is. <laughs> I mean, we're we're uh, you know we we have the universe that we've been dealt. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cool. Um, a message saying you might mention that the star, I don't know how you say it, Canopus is visible in the south in the early evening. There's Canopus right there. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, um, it's just barely on, um, on this plot. Um, and, um, yeah, as, as the questioner indicates, um, if we, if you go um, any further, it's going to be set. So, um, yeah. so yeah, it's 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 right um, almost due south. Um, this is at uh, seven thirty. So yeah, due south at seven thirty. If um, if you want if you want to uh, to find a south pole for us, um, look uh, um, look at Canopus, um, and it's yeah. Um, so there's Polaris, which is our North Pole, and Canopus is kind of a South Pole for us at that particular time of the night. <laughs> cool. yeah. Good point. I, um, I like that. All right, let's see here. Um, it was interesting. Oh, where, where'd it go? It was interesting to focus on the clusters. I'm wondering if we look towards Leo or Virgo cluster galaxies, if these are the brightest objects in the field of view, or did you just filter out lots of the Milky Way foreground stars that are brighter? Yeah, so um, the the pictures, I mean, so so we're looking at, at let me turn off the constellation lines. Um, so here is, you know, roughly the distribution of, of stars that are brighter than than um, than um, fifth or sixth magnitude. Um, so the stars that we can see with our naked eye at, from a good dark site. Um, we, from our point of view, they're not they're not strongly concentrated towards uh, towards the galactic equator, um, towards the Milky Way. But that's partly because the um, the plane of our galaxy also absorbs a lot of light. You know, and, and so, so indeed, we see a lot of bright stars. You know, like Castor and Pollux up here, um, Rigel, um, Sirius, that are off the plane of the Milky Way. Um, there are bright stars. You know, clearly in in Leo, um, there's Regulus, there's Denebola, um, but um, but the, the you know if if you look at at fainter and fainter stars, they do indeed get um, less common. Um, as you go towards the the galactic poles, um, so um, so you know if you look at the at at the Leo triplet, you don't see a lot of foreground stars there. Um, if you look at the at the Virgo cluster, you don't see a lot of foreground stars there. But but there are some, and um, and you know especially if you go if you take deeper and deeper photographs, you'll see more and more um, foreground stars. Um, but um, but yes, the the density of of, of the stars is less. Um, going going above and below the the galactic plane. Interesting, cool. Um, so there aren't any more questions in the chat, but I had uh, one or two that I wanted to ask you. Sure. Um, you had mentioned at one point um, when you were describing a galaxy that it was lenticular. I know that describes the structure of it, but what exactly does that mean? Oh uh, yeah, sorry, um, I, Dan. Reisenfeld will probably talk about that um, more in, in his uh, um, talk next week. Um, maybe I'm maybe I should prime him with all with all the questions so that so that he's prepared. But um, so galaxies um, have been classified as as um, ellipticals and spirals and lenticulars. Um, lenticular um, basically means having the shape of a lens. So um, so it's 
it's like, um, so a, a spiral galaxy is flat, more or less, um, and it may have a bulge, um, and, um, and, but its aspect ratio, ratio, ratio is very, is very high, something like 10, 10 to one, or maybe even more than that in terms of its, of the, the, um, the, 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 the um, dimension of the disk to the thickness of the, of the disk. Um, ellipticals go all the way from being completely um, circular um, to, to, um, to very elliptical in shape. Um, and, um, and then when, when they're at their most elliptical, it almost becomes hard to distinguish them from a spiral galaxy seen edge on. Um, the lenticulars are, um, are a, a class of galaxy that, um, that seems to have very little or no spiral structure, um, and yet is, uh, is, is more, has, has a, um, a higher aspect ratio, you know, the, the, the thickness to, to um, dimension of the disk than is characteristic of elliptical galaxies and also may have may have a kind of a cusp-like feature towards towards the edges of the disk. Um, and, and so they're called lenticular because they kind of look like lenses. Um, another um, another uh, terminology for them is S0, um, sort of like spiral zero <laughs> as opposed to a, a spiral a or spiral b or spiral c which are different classes of spiral galaxies but um um but um yeah dan may talk about that um if not we we can cover galaxy types um in a in a different talk but i'm sure dan will will cover that um but that's it's it's an interesting topic i mean the the, the question of, of galaxy classification is 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 fairly fraught um you know how um how do you distinguish, you know, a, um, a, a very th thin um, disk galaxy from a from a very, you know, it, is it an edge-on spiral? Is it is it a um, a very thin elliptical galaxy? Um, that's that's a difficult difficult question. And and what um, is there, you know, do galaxies have a tendency to evolve towards the elliptical, um, which seems to be the more relaxed? Um, state, um, and and I think a lot of people think that um, if there are a lot of collisions among galaxies, that that uh, the product of collisions tends to be ellipticals. Um, but there's there's a lot of discussion about that. Interesting. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we got another question coming in. As galaxies merge, does the total number of galaxies decrease? <laughs> well, yes, I suppose it would. <laughs> Where you had two, now you have one. Um, uh, I think it takes a long time for, you know, I mean, the Andromeda galaxy and our galaxy will someday collide um, some five to seven billion years from now, um, after our sun has left the main sequence. Um, and, um, and that collision will take a very long time. Um, but um, it, it'll be dissipative. Um, so um, the you know the stars will will note will not really notice each other as as they pass through through each other, but um, but the gas and um, um, and other constituents of the galaxy will um, mingle and um, and slow the whole process down, and so you dissipate a lot of the energy that you in initially start with, and eventually um, you know it'll it'll settle down into into a single blob, which is probably going to look like an elliptical galaxy. In the end, um, and then you would have had you would have had one galaxy um, where you had two to begin with. Um, is there an opposite process? Do galaxies ever um, split off? Um, I can't imagine that that happens. Um, I you know gravity is is the overwhelming force there, and especially with dark matter ever pulling everything in, I suspect that that um, that they would not. Um, of course. You know, we do have this this um, this uh, expansion going on, which which apparently seems to be accelerating, and um, and maybe um, in some very distant future, that um, accelerating expansion might um, might rip galaxies to shreds. Um, in which case, you'll you'll have a plethora of them where you had a few before, but um, um, but I think that's pretty speculative. I don't think anybody really really. Really believes that. 
<laughs> Maybe, I don't know, who knows? Yeah, um, and then sort of related to that, how many galaxies have already merged into what is now the Milky Way? Oh, um, several. We how have, sorry? How do we tell what? Right. <laughs> so um, we have um, evidence of, um, of streams of things that, uh, that have, um, you know, streams of stars and streams of, of star forming regions that, that, uh, that peel off of the disk of our galaxy in different directions. And, um, and some of them come from the Mag Magellanic clouds, which we are um, presently interacting with um, very strongly, but others can't be traced to the Magellanic clouds. And so, um, and so they're thought to be remnants of prior collisions um, uh, that, that took place you know, some time ago. Um, you can also look at the distribution of, um, of, the, of the velocities of stars in our galaxy and, and you find some that, have, um, that are, are going against the flow um, of you know, the rotation of, of stars around the galactic center and stuff. And, and so um, you suspect that that might be um, the result of a, of, a, of, a mer of a possible merger or, or, or a merger that wasn't ever completed. Um, and um, well, we're, we're getting a lot more information about that um, with the satellites Hipparchos and Gaia, which have um, uh, tremendously augmented our store of information on star um, motions and speeds um, and so forth. And so, so we'll have a lot more information that, that can help us kind of piece together those, um, the sort of archeology span of our galaxy. But I think it's a very difficult thing to do um, to really decide you know, what came from where and, and when these various things happened. Another clue that you would have is, is if the chemical compositions of, um, of a population of stars with, with a different um, set of um, velocities is different from the population of stars in the disk, that would tell you something um, possibly about um, a, uh, an, an ancient merger. But um, yeah, those are difficult problems to solve. No, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I haven't seen any more questions come in. Um, so I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, Galen, thank you so much again for sharing this, these fascinating uh, and gorgeous galaxies <laughs> with us tonight. <laughs> Thanks again for tuning in and good night to everyone. Thank you, Laura. And, and, and thank you everyone for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>